You're fine. Well, good morning. So uh, Wayne mentioned that I'm a pilot, uh, which is true. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't have a call sign. So uh, Wayne, thanks for that introduction. Pat, thanks for your enthusiasm in putting on the conference. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, thanks for talking to us this morning. You know, the purpose of why we're all here, you know, is really just to have a dialogue around the commercial space industry, where it is and where it's headed. Uh, and I hope I can advance that a little bit with some comments and some slides this morning. Of course, the dream of human commercial space flight has moved we think one step closer to reality with the third round of commercial crew contracts, CC ICAP, and we kind of view that as NASA infusing capital into the industry ecosystem. And it doesn't flow just to the awardees, it flows from the awardees to our supplier partners, to infrastructure providers, it goes all the way out to colleges and universities, and frankly, it eventually reaches our future workforce. We do, however, face a number of challenges, not only in developing human commercial spaceflight, which I would submit is fairly straightforward, but I think the harder challenge, which is creating, building, and sustaining an entire new industry of will personal and commercial spaceflight. And so in uh, preparing for today's remarks, I really spent a lot of time thinking about new industries, uh, where they come from and why, what makes them uh, endure, uh, and how uh, there might be parallels between those industries and what we're trying to do in the commercial spaceflight industry. So, First, I said, what, uh, what has to happen for new products and services to emerge? And I think about things in our lifetime. And uh, usually there is a need, uh, maybe uh, known or unknown. And in our lifetime, new industries seem to have come about because of the advance of technology. And technology has allowed a need to be fulfilled uh, when prior to that technology had, had not been. And usually what technology does is drive down the cost to meet the need. Okay, so it seems pretty fundamental. Uh, I liken it to, you know, I now have in my briefcase a small piece of plastic and silicon that 10 years ago I didn't have. And 10 years ago I didn't even know I needed. It's called an iPod. Uh, on it, I can now load every CD that I own or ever want to own, and I can go out into some infrastructure and I can download almost any song ever produced in the history of the music industry. Uh, Ten years ago, I had four or five boxes in the basement filled with eight-track tapes and cassettes and these big black round things which are actually in a box with four move tags on it, which I haven't thrown away, but I still keep. I don't have a turntable to play them on anymore, but I still have the records because I'm convinced someday they'll be valuable. <laughs> well, what made the iPod successful? Well, there was a need, not a need I knew about, but there became an evolving need, and then technology allowed that need to be satisfied at a cost that was below the value created by the product, right? and that value created by the product essentially was what people were willing to pay to carry one of these devices around. Right? And so that's sort of what has to happen in our industry as well. And we'll talk a little bit today about what those needs might be and where technology is taking us and where we are in the journey. Now, I would argue that simply having this matching of uh, a need and a capability is like the beginning of a chemical equation, but often you need an ecosystem and you potentially need a catalyst for that chemical reaction to occur. And it strikes me that there's sort of four uh, parts of that ecosystem that are really, really important 
to develop a healthy and sustainable industry. Uh, first, we need capital. And capital comes in many shapes and sizes. It can be venture capital, which is uh, like Kleiner Perkins, which I think is one of the founding VC for the Apple uh, company. There is uh, R&D money that comes from government. There is personal capital that comes from individuals. They're the capital markets, uh, debt, and equity. We need some kind of an infrastructure. Uh, not every entrepreneur can afford to build a music industry, put all the copyright laws in place to understand how value is going to flow in the industry, or for that matter, to build a spaceport or a launch pad. We need a regulatory and tax environment that is favorable to entrepreneurs to spend their time and effort uh, where they realize that the rule of law will be predictable right, and manageable. And then the fourth item is we need a workforce. We need, if they're in the iPod business, we need folks in Silicon Valley who want to do C++ software. Uh, we need musicians. We need musicians' agents. We need business people. We need contracts folks. And dare I say, we need lawyers as well. So those are some of the things that I want to talk about today uh, and where I think we are in each one of those. Uh, but I thought before I went into my formal remarks, uh, I thought we might all take a moment to reflect about why we all want to be part of the space business in the first place. And in a word, I will tell you that it is cool, it is exciting, it is fun, uh, it is unlike I would argue any other business that I have at Boeing or any other business that I know. Two months ago, our country, and frankly indeed the world, lost a pioneer in the space exploration business with the passing of Neil Armstrong. So one of the great things about working at Boeing, and there are some very great things about working at Boeing, is uh, our team upon the passing of Neil, put together a tribute video in honor of his accomplishments. And what I'd like to do this morning is share just a portion of that memorial with you because I think it speaks to the reason that we all want to be part of a healthy, sustainable spaceflight industry. Thank you. If you'll, oh, I guess I do that. Okay, there we go. We'll roll the tape. Thanks. Okay, we don't have any sound. I can hear it. Hey, AV team. Did you un unplug the little mic, the earphone jack from the PC? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. I never met Mr. Armstrong, but he was an amazing influence to me as a kid. I was, I guess, six years old when the moon landing occurred, and I went to my piano teacher's house, and she had a color television, and I actually got to see the launch on the color TV, and it was just made a really huge impression on me. Roger, tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. For that brief moment in time, uh, the entire world uh, stood still and watched a tremendous thing happen. And I did have the opportunity to meet him once, and it was just such a, an impressive situation for me because he was, um, he was one who inspired me to go on to do uh, what I did later on in life. Although I wasn't there to witness him step on the moon for the first time, he was a major impact on my life, along with the other Apollo, Gemini, Mercury astronauts and all of the engineers to make it happen. They are the reason why I decided to pursue a career in space exploration. A few times I ran into Neil personally, he was an absolutely delightful guy. I mean, he's just a fun guy to talk to, fun guy to work with, and uh, 
can't do much better than Neil. We thrive on challenge. After all, the essence of the industry is doing things better. Better might be safer or faster or more economical or lighter or higher or larger or smaller, but never easier. It's not our way. Excellence is your business. Well, thanks. You know, I think, by the way, I, I suspect everyone in the room has had a chance to meet Neil and that we've all been touched. Um, and I would just add, I think he had it exactly right. This industry loves hard stuff, right? We just thrive on a challenge. If we wanted to do something easy or simple, we wouldn't be in this business. We'd be making iPods. We are in it because it is hard, because it is challenging, and because we all want to be part of something that's new and exciting. And our challenge, of course, is to live up to the inspiration that Neil provides and do things better. Now, one of my peeves about our industry is we spend a lot of time talking about what we have done in the past. And we have done such, in our lifetime, we really have gone from you know, Sputnik to the moon to ISS, uh, back to Mars a couple times, and we celebrate things that have happened and we've made movies and we have heroes. I'm here to say I think the best times in the commercial spaceflight industry are really ahead of us. And I want to spend the rest of the morning talking about where we're going and how I see that we're going to get there. And then end talking about maybe some of the future Neils and what they'll provide to the commercial aerospace industry. So next chart. Um, I get a question a lot about uh, Boeing's participation in the commercial space flight industry. And people say, they come up to me, my peers at some of the large aerospace primes, and they say, why are you doing that? Why did you bid, you know, we bid on COTS and we bid on CC Dev, now CCI Cap. And people have come up and said, isn't that really for the small entrepreneurs? Why is Boeing, Boeing, you're building 747s. Why are you in that part of the market? Um, and I, I look at the commercial space flight market with the historical perspective of where we've come in the commercial aerospace market. And about 100 years, there were a group of entrepreneurs named Boeing and Lockheed Brothers and Northrop, and 20 or 30 years after that, an entrepreneur named McDonald who brought together their personal capital and capital from other sources, worked together with the government and infrastructure, uh, developed a workforce, worked uh, effortlessly, or no, with a lot of effort with the government on regulation and built what we have today is a very healthy, very vibrant, I guess we would argue about healthy some days, commercial uh, aerospace industry, which provides transportation for us all. That's really where we have been. That's really where our roots are. And we look at the spaceflight industry as evolving very much in the same way. And there's a quote on this slide from Brewster. I think everybody knows Brewster Shaw used to run our space exploration business within Boeing. And uh, Brewster really led the campaign and was the catalyst for our excitement and enthusiasm around the commercial crew program, but to go actually beyond that and to partner with other potential uh, service providers in the commercial spaceflight industry like Bob Bigelow because we believe there will be a healthy commercial spaceflight industry, and it's by the participation of companies 
uh, like you all and like Boeing that will make it a reality. So where are we? Um, and again, I, I talk to a lot of people. A lot of people come up and talk to me about, you know, what's it going to take? And if you go back and talk to Dave Thompson, you know, he wrote a paper in his MBA program about commercialization of space, and that was like 30 years ago. And people have said, why is it not happening? And I'm uh, the first to say, well, you're all wrong. No, it, it is happening every day. Uh, a lot of it we take for granted. And I wanted to point out that today there is a, a vibrant commercial satellite services business that makes money and returns value to shareholders. There are a whole series of companies, some you recognize, like Intelsat and Marsat and Telsat and SES. And there are actually new entrants like ABS and Satmex uh, and others that are entering this marketplace every day because it is a healthy industry. There is also a very robust satellite manufacturing industry, a commercial satellite manufacturing industry. And of course, we play in that at Boeing, as does Loral, as does uh, Talus, as does Orbital. And it is an, another part of our industry where we see new entrants every day. And then the third, uh, there is actually a very vibrant commercial launch industry that makes money, returns value to shareholders. Uh, Arion Space, ILS, Sea Launch, SpaceX, Orbital, and uh, dare I say, uh, George, the United Launch Alliance. And the United Launch Alliance, although well known for our work on EELV, at ULA we actually do provide commercial launches and I think we still have a commercial launch in our backlog. Interesting. Now the next step really is to go beyond the satellite industry into more of the commercial space transportation industry and then hopefully to the uh, human space flight industry. And uh, it's, it's really timely that we're all here today because we know on the 7th of October we had the first pure commercial robotic space flight to ISS, and that will soon be followed by Orbital's launch out of Wallops Island to go to ISS. Uh, we'll actually have two commercial viable robotic space transportation systems providing service cargo only to ISS. And that's a great interim step for where we all want to go, uh, a robotic mission and it is paving the way for the next step, which is the uh, launch of the commercial crew program, which gets us to the point where we are actually uh, providing space transportation on a commercial basis to, uh, to humans. And so for us, we call that the commercial crew transportation system. You know, Boeing was fortunate enough to be one of the three awardees of the CCI cap or the third phase of the CC dev program. Uh, I put this slide up just to uh, bring you up to speed a little bit on what's going on and what we're doing. You can see our drop test and our engine firing test. A couple comments about some of the milestones uh, that we're going to be achieving this month and next. Uh, by the way, we are on track, we are on schedule, we're performing, as is our industrial team which includes many of the folks that are here today. And uh, we are quoting a first flight date in the 2016 timeframe. So fairly shortly, uh, we will have a, a capability to commercially launch human beings into space, both to ISS and to other destinations as they evolve. Um, Another important aspect of the CCDEV or CCICAP program is competition. Uh, we're not surprised that NASA is driving competition in the industry. Uh, and frankly, we are all for competition. Next slide. Uh, what does competition provide? I think competition brings out the best in all of us. Uh, we are very, very pro-competition at Boeing. 
Uh, we, we compete almost on all of our programs all of the time. What does competition provide? Uh, what we have today, you have multiple primes. By the way, we have multiple places now where we can launch. So you can go to the Cape, you can go to Vandenberg, you can go to Wallops Island, you can come here to the spaceport, and frankly, there are a series of pads throughout the world. There is now a fairly rich and robust supply base at both the second and third tier level because of competition uh, generated by our customers and at the prime level. So we've been competing for the last 100 years and we look forward to continue to compete in the commercial spaceflight market. Okay, closing the business case in space. Uh, that means creating a value for a customer that exceeds the cost to provide. Uh, probably the holy grail to a healthy industry. First and foremost, I would say, of the things that one can do in space, we've cracked that equation in a couple really key areas. So the first one, uh, space is a really, really good place to observe things from. And you know, companies like GOI have actually closed the business case, got the infrastructure right, the taxation in the workforce, and are providing viable services around observation. Generally, Earth observation, you know, if, you, if you go beyond your iPod and you go to your iPhone, you, know, you can download imagery. Uh, I know in, in, at my house, I can actually download imagery that can tell me whether there is a car in the driveway, which is a phenomenal thing. Now, if we can get the latency out of the system, it will be really stunning. Uh, the second uh, business case that we've closed in space is this idea of communications. Uh, you know, it really started 50 years ago with a satellite called SINCOM, uh, and we have developed a very, very healthy, robust uh, communications industry relying on both LEO and GEO assets, and it goes from you know, direct TV to XM radio uh, to a whole variety of bent pipe uh, systems uh, and whole companies have, have arisen out of the ability to use space and to close the business case around communications. And then the third point is this whole research and development. By the way, I think research and development is always going to be a partnership between industry and government. And you may be wondering uh, what those photos are on the far right. Actually, we could do a little poll and see if anyone knows. But the, those are, uh, that's salmonella at the top, or salmonella on a Petri dish, and at the bottom is salmonella uh, uh, in residence in the lower uh, GI tract of a human being. Uh, we have not done a good job, I think, of getting the word out about all the rich research and development and the breakthroughs that have come out of ISS. And as a result of research done on ISS uh, around salmonella, we've actually come up with, uh, uh, with ac actually a, a cure, but a way to actively treat salmonella. And it's one of the many benefits of ISS and doing research in space. And uh, you know, part of by the way, Boeing's job as the prime contractor in ISS is to promote research on the station, but we also think together we ought to all be promoting research in space, and whether we do it on ISS uh, or we do it on robotic missions or we do it, frankly, in a, uh, a space station built by Bob Bigelow, I think the concept of doing R&D in space is pretty healthy. Okay, but where do we go from there? If we can close the business case on that, what, what is gonna take us to the next level? And I threw out three topics that we talk about a lot as an industry where I'm not sure we have yet allowed technology to close the business case for us. And by the way, the cost to get to and to get from 
uh, does drive the business case, so the cost of launch is really important. Um, manufacturing. Oh, we have for decades in my life talked about um, single crystal, very high pure crystal growth in microgravity, uh, manufacturing in space. We have done pilots. You know, frankly, we have achieved some success, but every time we break the code on how to manufacture something in space, it has turned out, frankly, just to lead a process that we could duplicate on Earth. But I believe we will eventually find something that it is profitable to manufacture in space and that we can afford to pay the cost for both the up mass and the down mass. The second one is mining. And you know, if, you, if you think about it for a minute, we've actually done mining. You know, we brought little chunks of moon rock down. I would hardly call that mining, but it's a start. Uh, we've run some numbers at Boeing. So with our current space transportation system, how many dollars per ounce does the material that you mine have to be? And it's really, really expensive, right? If you found gold or platinum on the moon or Mars, it doesn't pay to go get it and to bring it back. But it does if you find helium-3, and it does if you find other elements. And so I submit, as we think about closing the business case, there will be elements that we want to harvest and utilize either at that outpost or back, uh, back on Earth, and that mining will be one of those industries that will evolve in this next generation of commercial spaceflight. And then the third one, which I call space expeditions. Uh, this, is, this is not tourism. This is people who, who have a very thoughtful purpose and a reason to go into space. And it runs that whole gamut between maybe an individual who invented Microsoft Office who wants to have a life experience of being outside Earth gravity all the way to a country who's not a treaty signer on ISS but wants to have a spaceflight R&D program and can't get an astronaut slot on ISS but yet has the money and the national will to have a space program and is looking for another venue. Uh, and by the way, we are pretty excited about how the space expedition industry is progressing. I know a lot of you in this room are actually part of that. And we actually have seen probably more advance in that third column than we have in the first or the second. The role of government. Uh, like it or not, uh, the government is, has been and always will be our partner in the development of the commercial spaceflight industry or frankly any industry that we can think of. Uh, when I think about the role of government in the evolution and sustainment of an industry, I think about four roles, and they're kind of depicted on this chart. Uh, the first role, uh, and it's probably apparent to all of us, is the role of a customer. But I would submit, we think of them as a customer and as a consumer of the service. I like to think about government actually going beyond that. And as a customer, they are a provider of the highest risk venture capital. They are usually the first ones in, and they're not looking for a return on their investment. When you, when you win a CCI cap program, the government doesn't say, here's your 460 million, and oh, by the way, 10 years from now, I want the 460 million back plus 10% interest, as if you went to Wall Street. It is really risk capital. And as such, they become really the seed of a lot of the development that occurs in any industry and frankly in our commercial spaceflight industry. Uh, the second is the role of an infrastructure provider. I showed on the chart the national highway system. I talked before about launch pads. We know it's not just launch pads, it's launch pads, it's engine test stands, it is some manufacturing infrastructure, it is wind tunnels, it is 
high-speed digital computing. It is a whole variety of things that an industry that is as capital intensive and research intensive as our industry is needs to be able to develop the technology to drive the business case to closure. The third role is that of a regulator. Um, and you might go regulator, licensor, uh, auditor, officiator. But if I liken back to the commercial space flight industry, you know, in the beginning, the Wright brothers built an airplane, went down to North Carolina, and they could, f they could build an airplane in their garage, right, fly it anywhere they wanted to, in any airspace, over any building, over any populated area. In order for the commercial, space, the commercial aerospace industry to develop, we needed rules and regulations. We needed to chop up the airspace into different classes. We needed to actually create standards for the aircraft. We had to create some standards for pilots, right? And then we had to actually reach beyond the United States and create international standards so that you could get on a 747 out at Dulles uh, in the FAA-controlled United States airspace and fly to Heathrow, right, and land at an airport in airspace controlled by another country uh, with different regulatory uh, agencies, but yet with cooperative and sharing agreements so that you didn't have to carry two different kinds of radios, uh, you didn't have to carry two different kinds of fuels, and you could really have a global industry. And by the way, it took a really long time to get to where we are in the commercial uh, general aviation and commercial airline industry to where we have a pretty good regulatory environment, although many of us would say maybe overly regulated. By the way, there are still classes of airspace in the United States, I think we call them Class G, where you can go out to your barn, pull out your uh, J3 Cub without an electrical system, go hand start it, right? Uh, you can have a light sport license, which is a little bit lower qualification than a private or commercial, and you can fly your J3 Cub about anywhere you wanna go within that airspace at any time. And at the same time, by the way, we have the most restrictive airspaces in like class B with, a, uh, uh, with, with an overlay of, uh, of other restricted airspaces so that, yeah, we can fly our J3 Cub in our farm in Iowa, uh, but I can't fly my J3 Cub over the White House. And we've got a system of regulation that actually works, provides safe and reliable air transportation, and has allowed the industry to move to move forward. Uh, the fourth way a government uh, plays and participates is in what I call this regulatory environment, and that has to do with uh, taxation and rules um, and uh, credits, and I use the energy industry as we're kind of in the middle of this transition from fossil to renewables, and if you watch the debate, it was you know, highly contested about what the role of government should be in encouraging the shift from uh, uh, expendable fossil fuels to renewables. Uh, but I see in our industry the regulatory and tax, or the, the tax rules uh, as uh, incentivizing investment and participation in the commercial spaceflight industry, right? where the rules are predictable and they're stable, uh, and therefore uh, the environment is such that it actually attracts, uh, it attracts venture capital. Uh, another role of government is to help fund the very early stage research and development. Uh, and we saw that in the commercial aircraft industry. You know, the first aircraft sold to a customer was sold to the United States Army Single Corps, Signal Corps. Uh, I think our first sale at Boeing was to the government. Uh, the government actually put 
air mail on airlines, right, which allowed us to, as, uh, to be the seed for profitability on airlines. And in our industry, I think government will continue to fund very early stage research and development to help bring technology to change, if you will, that equation of cost and benefit. Uh, Don Pettit, which many of you know, uh, was on ISS. You know, he's coined the phrase, the tyranny of the rocket equation. I think one of the constraints that we have as an industry is this thing called the rocket equation. I, I know I'm in a room with a bunch of rocket scientists. I'll take a shot at it. Please don't correct me. But the, the, the tyranny is there are three things that you need to worry about in, in the, the rocket world. It's delta V, which is you know, how much do you need to uh, accomplish the mission, which is either to get into orbit or to go from orbit uh, to, the, to the moon or from uh, orbit to Mars. And that's sort of what your requirement is. There's how much energy is in your fuel. And right now we're constrained by uh, LOX hydrogen, LOX kerosene, solid fuels, but essentially uh, stored chemical energy in our propellants. And then the final part of that rocket equation is what we call mass fraction, which is I need this much delta V and I'm going to get it from this chemical. How much of that chemical can I shove into my rocket versus all that other stuff that wants to be on the rocket like structure and guidance and, oh yeah, that thing at the top called payload. Uh, we've been living within the tyranny of the rocket equation for a long time. Uh, we've gotten better. We're more efficient. We can build our rockets cheaper. We've had new entrants that have driven the cost even lower. But there are still some laws of physics in the rocket equation that I think are going to provide a constraint over the growth of our industry. And I think it's important for all of us, and especially the government, to continue to spend a significant amount of R&D to find another way to achieve, uh, if you will, uh, uh, propulsive force or to find a way to get relief from uh, uh, the, the forces of gravity uh, in US orbit uh, and some of those other laws of physics we find as we think about going outside of Earth orbit. Uh, and I simply want to throw that one out because uh, I think it is, it is, if you will, uh, the last hard part of the puzzle that we need to solve. Uh, before I get to my last slide, you know, I talked about uh, venture capital. Uh, I talked about regulation. I talked about infrastructure. I want to spend a minute and talk about the workforce. Uh, many of you, as I get to do, go out to colleges and universities. I get to recruit. Uh, I go back to my alma mater. I can tell you it's a lot of fun. Uh, nine out of the ten students that I talk to, uh, first thing coming out of an aerospace engineering department they want to talk about is they want to be in the space program. They are still extremely excited about the potential of what we can do in space. And so what I did rather than for me to stand up here and talk about the excitement of the young workforce that has come into this industry, uh, I prepared another short video clip. Uh, and you'll see Tony and Kavya, who are part of what we call at Boeing the Houston Six. Uh, and it's a group of young six engineers, obviously, who work on various aspects of our CCICAP program. And for us, they are part of that next generation of rocket scientists that will help lead Boeing's commercial spaceflight effort. And I'll roll the tape. I'm the first engineer in my family, the first uh, generation of my family to be able to work on such innovative and amazing things. And now with the end of the shuttle program, we need the next answer. And it's just amazing to see the commercialization of space exploration to make it safe, to make it affordable, and to create the next generation of innovation for our generation. We've seen in the past with Apollo, we saw in the past with the space shuttle and the building of the International Space Station. Today we can create 
creates a future working on commercial space exploration and getting to be a part of that, being able to wake up and say, I'm a part of this effort is just one of the best feelings I could ever have to be a part of building a spacecraft for the future today. I love to work in the commercial space program since the future my generation sees for humankind's progress in space is one that of a profitable and sustainable space industry and more importantly one that is accessible to common man. And it is this future I see myself being instrumental in creating. And it is definitely a dream of every rocket scientist to be working on a space program that would revolutionize the way we explore this final frontier. Yeah, I thought it was important to show a couple uh, of our Houston Six because you know, if, you, if you kind of read the popular press, you might walk away with the idea that the only place that there are entrepreneurs, the only place that new entrants in the industry want to go are, are small entrepreneurial startups. And by the way, those are terrific. And 100 years ago, of course, Boeing was a small entrepreneurial startup. But uh, we want those people as well. Right? And there is room in a company the size of Boeing for small, very passionate, emotional uh, young entrants into our industry and uh, we hope we are doing our part in creating a place for those graduates from college and universities to go um, and to live their dream of being involved in the next generation of uh, the, the human spaceflight industry. So in wrap up, and I have maybe about five minutes, Wayne or something, if we can take a question or two. You, you, you have probably more questions that I want to take, but I just maybe touch on a couple things. Uh, we need to keep working on this rocket equation. Uh, I know at Boeing and at ULA and at Lockheed and a lot of other places, we are, we are striving for another half a percent of efficiency. Uh, we're going after mass fraction. We're going after the cost of manufacturing. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do the math and understand that there are always going to be limits if we don't find another propulsive technique to get us uh, to Earth orbit and out of Earth orbit. The second bullet is uh, this is not an industry where industry is going to go it alone. And the commercial air, uh, aircraft industry wasn't. And I think we can uh, take a lot of lessons from how that evolved uh, to point to the partnership that we need in the commercial spaceflight marketplace. Um, and that means that uh, the government and government agencies, by the way, both in the US and around the world, are going to be our collaborative partner. Uh, and we need to embrace that and understand what our swim lanes are in our roles. And then, as I mentioned several times, uh, there are probably a lot of models uh, of industries uh, at Boeing, we kind of look at the commercial aircraft industry as a model for what can happen here um, and what can uh, develop. And you might say, well, you've never had the technological problem in the commercial aircraft industry and the propulsion problem, uh, if you really believe the rocket equation that we do here in the commercial spaceflight world. And I would submit what really uh, expanded and drove the commercial aircraft industry was the advent of a completely revolutionary propulsion system. If we were stuck in internal combustion propeller driven aircraft going at 200 knots on a good day, 250 knots, the industry wouldn't have developed, the needs wouldn't have fulfilled. I mean, think about your trip from Kennedy to LAX in a Lockheed Constellation versus a 777, whole different value proposition. And it took some really smart people doing some real smart things. By the way, it was a collaborative effort by government and industry that allowed us to get to a, uh, the modern jet engine uh, and eventually to the high bypass engines that we have today, which are a good compromise between propulsion efficiency and environmentally friendly. Uh, so we have lived 
a major technological change in the commercial aircraft, commercial airline industry, and I expect in my lifetime we will see the same thing happen in the commercial human spaceflight industry. Anyway, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit this morning. Uh, again, I hope uh, I furthered a little bit the dialogue around some of the things that we need to do and some of the challenges that we have. I couldn't be more excited. I actually think we will look back in five or ten years at the October 7th docking of the Dragon to ISS or Orbital's launch uh, upcoming here from Rollups as you know, that was really the first true commercial space flight mission. Uh, uh, which was then followed by many, many more, tens and then, then dozens and then hundreds and then thousands that actually created a viable, sustainable commercial spaceflight industry. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Roger, that was great. I, I know in our, uh, in our discussions that people frequently ask, is there really a business case? And I think you made a really great discussion today of the business case. And if a commercial organization like Boeing mm -hmm. Corporate has looked at it and hard-nosed accountants have right. reviewed it and they think there's a business case there, as you articulated today, uh, that really speaks well for the industry. Well, thank so you. You have two puffball questions. Okay. And then you'll be uh, off the stage. All right. Um, first of all, uh, one of our uh, people in the audience has asked what do you anticipate the launch rate and growth to be for the CST-100. So in the future, um, how, how many launches a year do you think CST-100 will be able to, to do? Well, okay, that's, that's a great John Mulholland question. So the terrific thing about... Uh, what do you think, John, 100, 200 a year? Well, you know, of course, of course uh, uh, well, let me answer the question and then we can expand on that. The, the CST-100 is built as part of the commercial crew program, which I think we all understand is to replace the reliance on Soyuz. Um, the Soyuz essentially goes up twice a year. Uh, we're building our CST-100 business case around two launches a year, if you will, for the life of the International Space Station, which, you know, again, we I don't want to get off into what that number is, but but we're hopeful at Boeing it's going to be well into the next decade. So, uh, and, and we believe that that has to be the base for commercial crew. And if we got to, if you will, break even around that base. And then if we can get additional launches beyond that to other places, again, uh, uh, Bob Bigelow's space station being the one that seems the next uh, uh, furthest in development, and we can add more launches, but our our launch rate, uh, uh, you know, I don't see any reason why the CST launch rate uh, can't be uh, uh, very similar to the kind of launch rates we have on Atlas and Delta coming off of a single pad. And on a on a good day, we can launch an Atlas or Delta kind of on six week centers, and we might be able to do better than that. Uh, there are some. We designed CST-100 to be reusable, so it's designed in such a way that after it lands, it's good for about 10 or 12 flights. You know, we have to do some retrofitting. There's some consumables that have to be replaced, but it was designed to be turned around very, very quickly and support a high launch rate. And John Mulholland is here, who's our program manager, and if you want more detail than that, you'll have to ask John. Super. Last question, we have about 30 seconds, so short answer. Uh, is there a business case for suborbital high-speed point-to-point transportation in the future? Yeah, um, boy, not with the technology that we have today. Uh, is we, boy, we looked at that hard, and remember, we, had, uh, we were involved in the SST. You know, Boeing was part of a national team, uh, which was su suborbital but still atmospheric. Uh, we, and we, by the way, we, we actually have people at Boeing Commercial who spend a lot of time thinking blue sky. So we're always trying to bound the limits of, is it, do you go real, real slow and save a lot of money in propulsion? Do you go real high and real fast? And uh, I think many of us know the business case was having trouble closing for the Concorde at the very end of its life. The SST that the U.S. was going to build 
You know, on paper, it looked like we could close a business case. Frankly, it was marginal at the time that the program was canceled. It was dependent heavily on government funding, kind of like a super collider. And for today, with the technologies that we have, forget the environmental, the noise, the infrastructure, the size of the runway that you need, but we have not found, uh, nor do we have line of sight to the technologies that will make uh, uh, high-speed suborbital will close uh, with the transportation needs that we have today. So, good. Thank you very Wayne, much, thank Roger. You. Uh, thank, join with me in thanking Roger.